This is Michael Altos recording Neuromuscular Blocking Agents and Reversal Drugs, Part 2. Now we're going to talk about some specific agents, and the first agent we'll discuss is succinylcholine. Succinylcholine is actually the only available depolarizing muscle relaxant available in our practice currently. Uh, in England, in parts of Europe, it's called succimethonium, and it's the same drug. If you look at acetylcholine and you look at succinylcholine, you can see the similarity. Succinylcholine is actually basically two acetylcholine molecules joined together. It works very rapidly in less than a minute and only lasts for about 10 minutes or less in a normal person. And it's rapidly metabolized by pseudocholinesterase, which is a plasma cholinesterase. And so if you think about it, it's actually a first pass effect, isn't it? The drug is injected in the vein. It circulates all around the body, all the while being exposed to pseudocholinesterase. And by the time it's finally delivered by the arterial system to the muscles, only a small fraction of the drug ever reaches the neuromuscular junction. Certain patients may experience a slightly prolonged action of succinylcholine, as shown in the slide here. There are patients who have an abnormal pseudocholinesterase gene. This is the gene that makes the pseudocholinesterase enzyme, and about 1 in 50 people are heterozygous, which means they only have one functional copy of the gene. And these people will experience a slightly prolonged effect from succinylcholine, about 20 to 30 minutes instead of less than 10. About 1 in 3,000 people are homozygous for the defective gene, and they have a complete absence of normal pseudocholinesterase, and their block can last from 4 to 8 hours probably as long as it takes for succinylcholine to be metabolized and eliminated by the liver or some other mechanism. These patients can't be reversed in any other way, and the treatment is supportive care with mechanical ventilation and appropriate sedation until they have regained their strength. We can assess the activity of the pseudocholinesterase enzyme with a local anesthetic called dibucane. This is an anesthetic that actually inhibits pseudocholinesterase, and the percent inhibition is called your dibucane number. So when a patient experiences um, normal pseudocholinesterase activity, their dibucane number will be 80 or above, and that's considered normal. The 40 to 60 range is typical for heterozygous patients, and those who have no meaningful pseudocholinesterase activity will be in the 0 to 20 range. Cholinesterase inhibitors, the drugs that we use to reverse our non-depolarizing agents, should not be used to reverse succinylcholine. In fact, they can prolong the phase 1 depolarizing block. They do this, first of all, by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, leading to a high concentration of acetylcholine, and they actually, this will actually intensify the depolarization. These drugs will also actually inhibit pseudocholinesterase and reduce the hydrolysis of succinylcholine, prolonging the block. Non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents may also antagonize the depolarizing block, which means that succinylcholine will not work as well once a non-depolarizing drug has been given. Pancuronium has a second effect on succinylcholine in that it itself inhibits pseudocholinesterase. So there are two reasons that pancuronium might cause succinylcholine to work not as well. What's the dose for succinylcholine? The normal intubating dose is 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, although you can go as low as half a milligram per kilogram. We recommend using true body weight, not ideal body weight. You can give a second bolus of succinylcholine. So if a patient starts to move during a procedure and you just want to give them a little top-off dose, you can give them another, say, 10 or 20 milligrams, and that would be fine. You can do a succinylcholine infusion. Most of you have never and may never see that, but it is something that used to be done and can still be done from time to time. It's run at a rate of anywhere from half to 10 milligrams per minute, and the way I learned to do it was to take one or two vials and mix it in a 100 milliliter bag, 
and we just used to put it on a mini dripper and then put a nerve stimulator on them and titrate it until they had some twitches but not no twitches. You do want to prevent phase 2 blocks so your nerve stimulator may also be used to make sure you don't have any fade or other evidence of phase 2 block. Succinylcholine can be given intramuscularly if you don't have IV access, usually at the range of 4 to 5 milligrams per kilogram. And in laryngospasm, usually we'll give it 0.1 milligrams per kilogram IV. So this is just a fraction of the intubating dose, just enough to break the laryngospasm. And if you need to give it IM, you can do that too. And some advocate giving it into the tongue, which is a very vascular and well-perfused muscle, and may... Uh, expedite the breakage of the laryngospasm, which would be important. There are many side effects with succinylcholine, and most of them are related to the fact that it structurally resembles acetylcholine. In the cardiovascular system, succinylcholine will bind to the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. We know that in the neuromuscular junction it binds to the nicotinic receptor, but the side effect in the heart predominates due to binding at the muscarinic receptor, and this causes bradycardia and can actually decrease contractility. This happens with even relatively low doses of succinylcholine, like you might find if you give a second dose intraoperatively or if you have to give a small dose for laryngospasm. We sometimes see an opposite dose that would be tachycardia we, we see an opposite effect, like tachycardia, at higher doses. This may be due to binding of succinylcholine at the nicotinic receptors in the autonomic ganglia. Bradycardia is especially common in children, and as I said, in uh, adults when a second dose is given. And prophylactic tra treatment with atropine or glycopyrrolate may be appropriate, especially in pediatric anesthesia with very young children. If they do decide to give succinylcholine, often they will follow it with a dose of atropine. The fasciculations of succinylcholine are simply the agonist effect of the drug. That is, the succinylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptor, causes depolarization of the muscles, and this is the fasciculations that we see when we administer this drug. Fasciculations can be prevented by starting uh, with a small dose of a non-depolarizing drug, say one-tenth of the intubating dose, and letting that circulate for about two minutes before administering the succinylcholine. Patients complain of myalgias after receiving succinylcholine, and these seem to also be preventable with a defasciculating dose of the non-depolarizer. However, studies have not really been able to correlate the intensity of the fasciculations with the severity of the myalgias. Succinylcholine can lead to an increase in intracranial pressure and intragastric pressure, and these effects as well can be diminished by using a defasciculating dose. However, the increase in intraocular pressure is not attenuated with a defasciculating dose, and so patients who have an open globe injury may extrude the contents, contents of the open globe when succinylcholine is given. Hyperkalemia is one of the first thing people think about when we talk about side effects of succinylcholine, but there is a lot of confusion on this subject. We know that succinylcholine normally increases the serum potassium levels of any patient by about half a milliequivalent per liter. There's no evidence that patients who have renal failure are at any more increased risk of susceptibility uh, to this effect. Their serum potassium also will increase by the same amount. The only concern with patients in renal failure is that they may have pre-existing hyperkalemia and the succinylcholine may push them into a dangerous zone. But if they have a normal serum potassium, there should be no major concern about hyperkalemia in these patients when giving succinylcholine. There are some studies that show that patients with severe metabolic acidosis and hypovolemia may have an exaggerated response to succinylcholine. First of all, they may have increased serum potassium, and then the exaggerated hyperkalemic response on top may push their serum potassium into a dangerous level. And it has been recommended that we treat these patients by hyperventilating them, and maybe even by administering sodium bicarbonate prior to administering succinylcholine. 
Also, there have been studies showing that patients with severe intra-abdominal infections, especially those that have persisted for longer than one week, may have an exaggerated hyperkalemic response, and succinylcholine should be used with care in these patients. Patients who undergo certain neurologic injuries experience what we call proliferation of extrajunctional acetylcholine receptors. That means that the acetylcholine receptors proliferate outside the neuromuscular junction. And each time succinylcholine binds to one of these receptors, some potassium is released. And now, when, when, when patients have this proliferation of receptors, a widespread depolarization, depolarization leads to a very significant release of potassium throughout the body. Patient serum potassium can increase by 4 or even up to 10 milliequivalents per liter, and this seems to be largely independent of the dose of succinylcholine that you use. Pre-treating these patients with a non-depolarizer, like a defasciculating dose, does not prevent the hyperkalemia. For most of these injuries, the potential risk develops within about 96 hours after the initial injury, and it peaks at about 7 to day 10 days after injury. We'll discuss some of these in more detail, but certainly patients who have had burns, massive traumas, injuries to the central nervous system like a spinal cord injury or a stroke or severe Parkinson's disease are all at risk for this effect. In addition, patients who have renal disease, as we discussed before, we worry about hyperkalemia if they have pre-existing hyperkalemia. And then there have been some discussions about prolonged total body immobilization, which may lead to an increase in receptors, as well as patients who have underlying polyneuropathies or myopathies. And again, we will discuss some of these in more detail in the coming slides. Another side effect that has a lot of confusion is the concept of phase 2 block. A phase 2 block occurs once patients have received high doses of succinylcholine or have been exposed to succinylcholine for longer periods of time. It is also thought that the prolonged block in patients who have atypical plasma cholinesterase may be a phase 2 block as well. There are a lot of different explanations for why patients experience phase 2 block. Some of these explanations include uh, some sort of presynaptic block in the neuromuscular junction, uh, a reduction in synthesis and mobilization of acetylcholine, or perhaps desensitization of the postjunctional receptor, perhaps even a conformational change. The big question is, at what dose does phase 2 block occur? And an extensive review of texts and journals will show a wide range of answers, ranging from as low as 2 milligrams per kilogram up to as high as 10 milligrams per kilogram. I think that part of the range is due to the fact that inhalational anesthetic drugs accelerate the onset of phase 2 block. And so patients who had phase 2 block on the low end of this spectrum may have experienced it in the setting of a high dose of inhalational anesthetic. Phase 2 block is challenging because although anticholinesterase drugs like neostigmine may be used to antagonize the block, the response is difficult to predict. And in most situations, the recommendation is to allow the patient to undergo spontaneous recovery of neuromuscular function. Succinylcholine can precipitate malignant hyperthermia. And we've discussed malignant hyperthermia in earlier lectures, so we won't go into it today. I want to remind you that there are certain things that are not malignant hyperthermia. So for example, a young patient, usually a male patient, a child who gets uh, succinylcholine and dies of a hyperkalemic cardiac arrest, usually this is not true malignant hyperthermia, but in fact, this is a young boy who has undiagnosed muscular dystrophy, which led to a uh, very large number of acetylcholine receptors throughout his body. Remember that some patients have neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This is something people get in response to antipsychotic medications, and while a lot of the symptoms look like malignant hyperthermia, that is hyperthermia, muscle rigidity, we don't need to take any malignant hyperthermia precautions in these patients, and they may certainly have succinylcholine without any concern. We also discussed masseter muscle rigidity in the past. 
This is when patients get trismus, which is rigidity of the jaw muscles. And this can happen after giving patients succinylcholine. In fact, about 1-4% to of children who get sevoflurane and succinylcholine will show some transient mild masseter muscle rigidity. But anything beyond that, we need to assume is a malignant hyperthermia, especially if there's rigidity in any other peripheral muscles. Elective surgeries should be postponed. Treatment for MH should begin. The patient should be observed in the hospital for any signs of rhabdomyolysis, which is muscle breakdown. And then subsequent anesthetics should probably avoid um, succinylcholine and perhaps all triggers until the patient can be ruled out for malignant hyperthermia. So to summarize succinylcholine, there are absolute contraindications, and those would be malignant hyperthermia, a patient who already has a dangerously elevated serum potassium, a patient who's known to have a myotonia or some muscular dystrophy, a patient who's more than two to four days out from a central nervous system injury like a stroke or a spinal cord injury, and other patients who have had massive musculoskeletal injuries or major burns. And again, I should clarify, that's after being a few days out from the injury. We're going to stop here, so please consider any questions you might have and uh, let me know, and we'll be sure to go over them.